Hi, I'm Chris Group, and this is the Evidence-Based Esthetician, and we are talking with Dr. Larry Group today, and we're talking about melasma. Um, there's been some really interesting recent research in using microneedling with melasma. Um, I do it in my own practice and have for years, but we wanted to kind of share it with you because some people don't realize that microneedling can be used to possibly help in this condition. Sure. Let's talk about some of the other uh, modalities for treating melasma, gold standards, things like that. We have things like chemical-based things like hydroquinone. We also have some other uh, prescription drugs that we can use. We have chemical peels. We have chemical peels. And, and then there's there's some lasers, Q-switch lasers, our long pulse um, and DIAG lasers that have been used for melasma also. So you're, you're saying two different lasers, a Q-switch 1064 and a long pulse 1064. These are two types of lasers. We, that's something they call uh, skin toning or dual wavelength toning. We'll talk about that another time, mm -hmm. but um, so that's laser therapy. Um, I've also heard that IPL at one point was being used and now is being used again in this, this in different, different ways. So we have uh, chemical, we have um, Chem mechanical. peel. We have mechanical things like uh, we, like uh, microneedling, of course, and then we have the laser and IPL. Um, in your experience in using hydroquinone, do you have any issue with that particular formulation? Does it work? And if it does, is there issues with it? Well, hydroquinone um, at a four percent level is a script, so you would have to have it prescribed by a doc, somebody with the DEA license. Um, and yes, it can work, but it can't be used long term. And on darker skin types, sometimes it has a rebound effect where it makes it worse than what it actually started at. Um, and it's also banned in different countries. So it's banned in Canada, it's banned in Europe, so you can't use them in those countries. Um, it is fast. Um, but when you say fast, you put it on and then what a day later it's better. Or? Well, if you're on TV, it's 20 minutes. <laughs> um, no, no, we're talking about six to eight weeks before you start seeing any resolution. And there's multiple applications. Of oh that. yeah. You're using it every single day. Okay. Um, and back when I first started, it was kind of, that was, we used that, that had a retina in it. Um, and then we used uh, microdermabrasion when I first started to try to help with melasma. But hydroquinone um, is not my first choice. Okay. Let's talk about how melasma, what it is, um, what it isn't, uh, different forms of that. And then I can kind of talk a little bit about some of the, some of the latest findings on what melasma is. Well, melasma is a, a hormonally in, induced hyperpigmentation on the skin, and it can be caused by different things. It can be caused by pregnancy. It can be caused by birth control pills, especially the Depo-Provera shot. I saw uh, a lot of my clients um, develop melasma. Um, and then as in older women, um, sometimes thyroid conditions, and then also hormone replacement therapy. So anything that is hormonally induced, um, and then it makes this... Um, more pigment in the lower, lower layers of the epidermis, and some people think into the upper layers of the dermis. It's incredibly difficult to treat because it can be triggered by sunlight, it can be triggered by heat, um, you know, exercise that is in hot yoga or something that's bringing up the core temperature. Um, a lot of times we never say we're going to cure melasma, we're going to try to manage it the best that we can because it can always be lurking. Okay. So when we're talking about melasma, the basics of it, we have too much melanin or, mm -hmm. or melanin that's, that's concentrated in different areas, forming a pattern that looks like dark spots. Where does it tend to, to show up on, on, a, on a woman? And in your, your basis of treatment is when you're, you're looking at things, um, how do you differentiate melasma, say from sun spots or age spots or something like a uh, lupus. Well, melasma tends to have a pattern on the face and it tends to be more solid. So you'll see, and it tends to kind of mimic each, uh, each side of the face. So you'll see it through the cheeks, you'll see it on the upper lip, you'll see it maybe on the chin or then across the forehead. When I see it just on the upper lip, I actually talk to the person about whether or not they've had their lip waxed uh, by an esthetician because sometimes from waxing the upper lip and then having sun exposure that can cause a melasma type look but it's not actually 
melasma. It's hyperpigmentation. It's hyperpigmentation from, from, heat. from, from well, from heat and also um, from the waxing and from the sunlight. So when I'm talking to my clients, um, I talk about have they've ever been diagnosed with melasma and also what was the origin? Um, was it, you know, the birth of a child or uh, birth control or did they recently have a, a thyroid condition diagnosed? So there's different questions that you can ask to identify because as I'm an esthetician, I can't diagnose. Um, what I can do is identify a condition, but I can't actually diagnose a condition. Okay, well, because this is the evidence-based esthetician, let's look at some evidence-based research. Uh, this is an article that came out of Brazil. And uh, one thing I like to point out early on in this series is just because something doesn't come from the United States does not mean it's not valid research. Uh, Brazil so, has wonderful doctors. Yes, they, so we really have to get the idea that as, as a, uh, a world culture and folks in different parts of the world have some amazing access to great research, great researchers and resources. Uh, this one happens to come out of Brazil. Um, and basically what they did is they used microneedling at a depth of about 1.5. And I believe they were using micro rollers. We can look at that closer. And they treated uh, a series of patients. Um, I believe it's in the 20s, but they've shown pictures for a few of them here for this article that they microneedled their face. And over time, their melasma got much better. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess looking at the research and reading it, they also had other protocols with them. They were telling them not to stay out of the, you know, to stay out of the sun, wear their sunscreen. But... Um, so with any research, sometimes it's difficult to isolate that one particular variable, but I think they did a good job. They did some split face design, which means they did half one face and half the other face, not that way for a control. And with the results that they got, uh, let's take a peek here. Everyone likes to have uh, before and afters is here's a series of four different clients that they, they treated mm -hmm. and uh, before and after, after subsequent treatments, not just one, uh, they had quite a bit of resolution. When you look at those before and afters and you know, the, what the audience is looking on the screen, does that seem typical of what you're seeing with the folks that you're treating with microneedling uh, at your, at your uh, med spa? Um, absolutely. It's one of the things I love best about microneedling is it gave me another tool in my arsenal to help to try to um, manage melasma. Um, so what I've seen is a clearing of the skin um, and the skin looks um, lighter. You don't see as much of the line of demarcation around uh, the areas, um, but absolutely I've seen it in my own clients. And actually we've had um, papers or pictures published on the, the web of some of my clients that had melasma. Um, and it was one of those things where nothing else had worked. And I thought, and this was years ago, why not try it and see what happens? And um, both my clients and I were really, really pleased with the results. Okay. Um, right after this break coming up in a little bit here, we're going to be doing uh, some treatment on one of your clients for melasma. Yeah, yeah she and, uh, recently had a child, or actually she had twins. Yay! Um, and so uh, she's got some melasma from the pregnancy, and so we're going to be treating her. Now, she's also a licensed esthetician and instructor yes. as well. So together you're coming up with a protocol. She's actually been diagnosed with melasma, is correct. that correct? And correct. so based on what has and has not worked for her, uh, what, what's the plan? Um, well, we're going to be doing um, a couple of different treatments, and, um, and we're going to, uh, she hasn't used microneedling for uh, melasma at all. She's used some other things. She's done some chemical peels. Um, she's done a couple other modalities, but she hasn't tried microneedling and she can still see it. So we're going to be treating her and then showing the results. So this isn't the initial onset of the melasma. This no. is something, okay. So it keeps coming back, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Right. And I won't get into the different types of melasma right now, but um, for more information uh, about this particular research article, um, or for melasma itself, uh, you can go onto our website, uh, evidencebasedesthetician.com, um, and you can also contact us on Facebook, um, and you can tweet or... Uh, Let's get social. We can definitely get social. You can ask us questions about melasma. Um, we're, we're not going to give medical advice, but we can show you the evidence and some of the research out there of what other doctors are doing and some of the results they're getting. And as the purpose of this particular forum is to sort of as estheticians and skincare professionals, get rid of the hype that's around this, get rid of the things that don't work and start looking at the things that medicine and evidence show is actually working. So we have better results. So we have 
uh, happier clients. We make more money and everyone uh, comes out at the end of the day with a smile on your face. So thank you for watching Evidence-Based Esthetician. I am Chris Group, and this is Dr. Larry Group. Thank, thank you. you much. Hi, I'm Chris Group, and welcome to the Evidence-Based Esthetician. Today, we are joined by Tara Steinseifer, who is a colleague of mine and a very, very dear friend. Um, and what we're going to be talking about is melasma. Um, and I'm going to introduce, or I have introduced Tara, and she's going to tell you a little bit about her own experience. And she is also a uh, laser tech. She's a laser supervisor, and she's an esthetician as been in this game for a very long time. So welcome. Hi, thank you. So tell me about what's going on with your skin. Well, at this present time, I am a mother of two twin boys. Yay! Yay, and I love my boys. But I gotta tell you, melasma started creeping up on me during the pregnancy. So just like it happens for everybody, it definitely happened to me, even though I have all the skincare products and everything under the sun, it started coming up with all my hormones. And, um, yeah, so I've been having to try to take care of it lately. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's a good point because she has access to every machine, every Everything. modality, every product, and she still got melasma. Yeah. Interesting side note is um, I also have twins, and what Tara and I just discovered is the combined weight of both sets of our twins was the exact same for both of us, down to the ounce. 13 pounds and two ounces. Yes, yeah. those came out of these ones. <laughs> um, hard to know. <laughs> Yes. But um, with pregnancy and other hormonal issues, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's thyroid, sometimes it's HRT, sometimes it's birth control, yeah. women can develop melasma. Now, with your own melasma, what have you done so far to um, treat it? Well, once I was done breastfeeding, I started using hydroquinone, you know, mm -hmm. so HQ. I started using um, more of the alpha hydroxys, beta hydroxys, anything to try to take it down topically. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously lots of sunblock and things like that. Um, I did a chemical peel just to kind of break it up. But then what happened with me, and I don't know if this has happened to anybody else, but after the twins, my HCG level crashed out on me so bad that my naturopath put me back on HCG a little bit to bring it back up. So after the chemical peel, it helped, it broke it up, but then the melasma came rushing right back. Okay. So, so we're going to be treating that today. Now, you've had lots of patients who have had melasma. What are the different modalities that you've used to treat them? So fortunately, I've been really successful with treating melasma, and I've used anything from lasers to microneedling, microneedling being one of my favorite um, treatments. I've used chemical peels, I've used products. Uh, so there's, there's a few different um, tools in our toolbox that we can have to treat melasma. I remember mm -hmm. back, you know, 14 years ago, it was basically uh, hydroquinone and microdermabrasion. Right. And that was pretty much the standard of what we did. So we have right. a lot more options. Um, melasma, and as Tara knows from having, going back on the HCG, made it come back. Melasma, much like rosacea, is managed more than cured. Sometimes, you know, if we're lucky, we can have it go away and stay away for a long time. Sometimes it's more of just a management issue. Um, sometimes we treat it a few times a year, but then our clients go into hot yoga yeah. or they go into the sun and they get a sunburn and it comes back or they go on HRT. So it's really one of those things that we hope for the best, yeah. but sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Exactly. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be going into the treatment room with uh, Tara and she is going to be my client and um, instead of being behind the chair she's going to be laying down and um, we're going to be doing a treatment of microneedling for melasma and I'm also going to be throwing in a couple of other modalities to combine with it so I'm excited to get in the room and show you what we're doing. So one of the ways I treat melasma is by using a um, Q-switch laser. And this is kind of a special um, Q-switch laser as it is also a fractionated Q-switch. It's a 1064 ND YAG. Um, they've taken it, put it into a Q-switch format, which means it is um, delivering energy in a nanosecond, which is a billionth of a second, as opposed to a millisecond, which is a thousandth of a second. 
Um, it's also fractionated. So basically what I'm doing is delivering a wavelength of light that is somewhat attracted to pigment um, down at a lower level of the skin. So down at the uh, bottom of the epidermis or into the dermis. And it's also a mechanical delivery. So instead of thermal, when you're working with melasma, you don't want to be doing anything that can cause a thermal injury into the skin simply because heat can increase um, the presentation of melasma. So I don't use IPL in doing uh, melasma treatments, but I do use my Q-Switch um, 1064. And again, this is my fractional Q-Switch. Now, what's interesting is there's several different modalities now to help with melasma. This is just one of them. I also work with layering this wavelength of light with maybe microneedling or dermaplaning. Um, sometimes I may do a chemical peel on melasma. And with melasma, as we said, we've never talked about, um, you know, completely getting rid of melasma. We try to manage it. Now, our client here has not had her melasma for a long time. Um, she was pregnant and her babies are probably about two to three months old, but we did notice um, her starting to develop melasma, which is incredibly common when having children or possibly um, on birth control pills, uh, hormone replacement therapy, and we've also seen it in some perimenopausal women with thyroid issues. So basically, this handpiece just goes over the skin. There's no gel that is used. Um, you can see the light being delivered. One of the most important things is to make sure that your client's eyes are completely covered. Whenever you work on the face, um, with a laser or an IPL device, you don't want to have goggles that they can see out of. You want to protect their eyes because if you're down on the chin and you accidentally misfire up towards the eyes, then you can cause some ocular damage. So you want to make sure that their eyes are completely covered. Um, you also want to make sure that there is no makeup on the face. Um, I cleansed our client's face ahead of time. Um, if there's makeup on the face, the wavelengths of light tend to absorb into the first chromophore or the first pigment that they see, which means it's going to take the absorption into the makeup, not into the skin. And there's a really good chance if you do that, that you're going to cause an adverse reaction, otherwise known as a blister. Um, so you want to make sure that their face is completely cleansed before you do this treatment. You also want to make sure that you stay off of their hairline. Um, if you can see, I'm making sure that my handpiece is perpendicular to the skin. And I also brace my um, handpiece with my fingers to make sure that I'm going in um, a little bit of an overlap of a line. But since this is such a large handpiece, I want to make sure that it's not going to slip into an area that I want to avoid. So I'm going to go over her entire face, um, her forehead, her cheeks, we already did her upper lip and her chin. Um, and then that will complete this treatment. The interesting thing about the uh, fractional Q-switch is it's a really comfortable treatment. Um, there's not very many fractional lasers that can say that, so it's not going to cause a lot of discomfort. It's not going to cause a lot of redness or downtime. And I also use um, this handpiece when treating pigment on darker skin males, so it's not just for females. Um, some men do have melasma. It's usually maybe about 10%. Um, but they can have melasma and I can use this handpiece to treat that also. What I'm doing here is I'm just making sure that I'm blocking any type of light because light will travel until it hits something. So I use a four by four to help block any of the light from going over the top of the bridge of the nose. Um, that way, if it does go over the top of the bridge of the nose, it will be absorbed into the white 4x4 as opposed to what's on the other side of the room. We always want to make sure we're doing safe laser practices when we're working with lasers. So you will have your eye gear on as well as your client will have their eye gear on. And that way you don't have to worry about any ocular damage. Now, before we can start the actual microneedling procedure, I need to make sure that um, I've got all of the topical numbs up, which is the topical numbing cream that I use in my practice off of our client's skin. So I like to use witch hazel on some four by fours. I think it's a little bit more gentle on the skin than alcohol, but you need to use something that is going to make sure you don't have any residue of the numbing agent on the skin. So I'm just using um, a little bit of witch hazel that is on the four by fours. 
And then what I'm going to be able to do is, since I use a skin stylus in my practice, um, I keep the nose cones that are autoclave sterilizable. It's one of the important features on the skin stylus in their sterile wrapper before I work on my client. Um, I always let my client know and let them see that I've got the nose cone in a sterile wrapper. And then I'm going to open up the BioLock cartridge, um, which is also in a sterile wrapper. Um, I don't do this until the client is on the bed because if for some reason they decide that they're not showing up for the procedure, then I've just opened up a cartridge and can't use it. I also like to make sure that it's working and my needles are set to the proper depth. Now, what I'm going to be needling into my client's face is the Estheceuticals HACU Serum, which is a blend of native hyaluronic acid, copper peptide, and also alpha lipoic acid. It provides a really nice slip to the treatment, and it also helps to get a very large molecule, which is native HA or native hyaluronic acid, in through those micro channels. Um, I like to go in a pattern that is more of a cross hatch. Um, some people like to snake it up and down. I think the important part is to always make sure that you're starting from the inside of the face and then moving on to the outside of the face. You don't want to be taking any, um, or pushing any pressure on any vessels that might be next to her nose. One of the important uh, or parts of the procedure that we do um, here at Aesthetic Advisor is I use our air stylus. So the air stylus is a nebulizer and what I put into it is the HACU serum and it takes advantage of the micro channels that I just created. So what it's doing is it's pushing again that very large molecule which is the HACU serum through the micro channels that we just created. Now, as I move throughout our client's space or throughout your client's space, what you're going to do is you're going to change the depth on your device. And the reason I'm doing this is because all parts of the skin on the face are at different depths. Now, what I'm doing with my client right now is a little bit of what I would call age management. She is a really young woman, but she is getting a little bit of nasal labial folds. Um, so I am just going through that area at a little bit different of a depth. And again, I always follow with the HACU serum in my um, air stylus. So what we're treating with our client is melasma, and melasma can be at different depths. Since our client only had her children um, not very long ago, I'm treating it more like it is um, at the bottom of the epidermis than I'm treating a dermal melasma. You might be a little bit deeper on a dermal melasma um, than you would be with things that are in the epidermis. So I'm going to just continue on through the treatment, again, applying the HACU serum, using the skin stylus to create micro channels, and then using the air stylus to take advantage of those micro channels by pushing more HACU serum through those channels. So let's talk about technique. And I know some people like to go in circles. Some people like to go up and down. Some people like to snake the device across the skin. Um, what I think is important is that you're getting proper coverage on the area that you're starting from the inside of the face and working out. And one of the big things is when you get over to the outside of her face, you want to make sure that your handpiece is still perpendicular to the skin. Okay? So when you look, when I get out to there, I'm turning my hand and I'm turning my wrist to make sure that all of the uh, microneedles stay in full contact with her face. If you have them or you're pulling up a little bit, sometimes you'll have a little bit of drag on it or sometimes the um, handpiece will feel like it's catching a little bit. So you want to make sure that you have uh, the handpiece fully uh, perpendicular with the skin. Now, if you notice, our client is actually quite comfortable. Um, 
The topical numbing that we use is called Numbs Up and it is an over-the-counter 4% lidocaine. If it is applied properly, what I've found is it provides as much numbing as the script that I used to use. And another advantage of it is because it comes in 3 ml packets that it allows me to send them home with my clients and they can apply it themselves, which is going to cut down on some of my treatment time. Now, what I was just doing was using the air stylus to put some of the HACU serum onto the skin, which now I'm going to be doing a little bit more of age management. So I'm going a little bit deeper into the tissue. Um, sometimes I like to stamp when I'm doing this. I'll also stamp on sometimes if she has, um, you know, an imperfection, maybe an acne scar, which she doesn't have, but she does have a couple of little chicken pox scars, which I have found on my clients. So you can use different methods. Um, the one that I don't really care for is when people go in circles because I think that puts a lot of pressure on the needle cartridge. Um, so I don't use that personally, um, but I know some people out there do. And again, what you want to really do is make sure that you are getting proper coverage over the whole face. Um, so you're not um, missing anything. Now, when I wipe the skin down during the treatment, you saw at the beginning of the treatment, I had 4x4s and I had witch hazel on those 4x4s, which was to remove the numbing cream. I also have another little pile of 4x4s and those are soaked in a sterile saline solution. And if I get any petechia on the face or if I want to remove anything from the face while I'm doing the actual microneedling treatment, um, I will use sterile saline to remove um, whatever I'm trying to wipe off of the face. Um, at that point, I don't want to use any witch hazel because I don't think it's necessary. But you also don't want to use anything like tap water um, because... We all know that there's sometimes not the best things in your tap water. So I want to make sure that you're not microneedling um, or using that to wipe on the skin and having anything go through those micro channels that you've just created. So with my treatments, I just like to go back and forth between the air stylus and the skin stylus. And sometimes I'm using the... Um, HACU serum to push through the micro channels. If I haven't microneedled in the area yet, I might just be using it to um, put down the product that I'm going to be microneedling in. And if you notice, when we use the air stylus, we can reduce some of the erythema that's on the skin. And quite frankly, one of the reasons my clients like it so much is it feels really nice. And if you work on a client without any topical numbing, if you use a technique where you're um, going in between both the um, skin stylus and the air stylus, it gives them a little bit of a break. And um, it's kind of nice for them to not have something that's a little bit ouchy for a minute. Um, now, the 4x4 that I have is got witch hazel on it. When I do a treatment on somebody's face, I like to start at the bottom of the face. And what I do with that is I leave the numbing cream on uh, her forehead or his forehead, because I do this um, on guy's skin too. And the reason I like to leave it on the forehead longest is because the forehead is the ouchiest area of all. When you think about it, you don't have that adipose tissue. Um, to be cushioning the bone. So you're going right against the skin that's against the bone. So we're going to lower our depth down. Um, you never want to use a really high depth um, on the forehead um, because it's going to be painful and you're going to get a lot of petechia. Now if you notice when I was stretching out her uh, where she would have 11s if she had a lot of 11s, um, I would use my fingers on her eyebrows. I try to keep my hands off their face as much as possible. I know some people like to hold the skin taut, um, 
but she's a young woman. She really doesn't need that. Uh, it's not like I'm dermaplaning her and would be holding the skin taut. So I like to keep my fingers off of her face while I'm in the process. And for estheticians, that's a really hard thing to learn because we are always trying to um, touch people's faces. So if you notice, my hand placement is on the top of her head, on top of her hair, and then I keep everything else as much off of the skin as I can. Um, again, with this, I'm just going to cross hatch back and forth. She's actually pretty comfortable. Um, and if you look at the lower part of her face, you can see the erythema, and that's exactly what I want to see. Um, with this treatment for her melasma because again I believe it's a little bit more epidermal which means I don't need to get to petechia I just need to see some erythema in the skin. I'm going to blow the HACU serum back through the micro channels and what I found is when I do this not only does it feel nice to them but I think I get a better treatment out of it and because they refer me a lot of people I think they think so too. Um, so it's a really simple procedure to do, especially if, um, you've done microderm or things like that. Um, it's a real simple procedure. Now, when we get to the nose, one of the things is I want to make sure that you dial the depth of your needles back down to very, very low. I mean, 0.1, 0.2. Um, you know, you've got cartilage up on the nose. It's not going to be really, really comfortable. So I use a very, very shallow depth when I'm working on the nose. And I just take it down through the alar area, uh, down the sides, and then down the bridge of the nose. I don't go over the bunny lines. And what the bunny lines are, if you've ever had Botox in it, is at the top of the nose, um, but on the sides, kind of like where your sunglasses or your glasses, uh, if you had them where the little pads would rest. And the reason I don't do that is because there's a lot of vessels that run through there and I don't want to bruise my client. So I stay off of those areas. And again, everybody's going to have their own technique, which works for them. Um, this is just my technique, what I have found to be very successful with my clients. Um, and doing this over, I don't know how many years now, quite a few. Now I'm going to finish her treatment by applying our brightening cream, which is going to help with the pigmentation issues. After that, we'll be giving her post care, um, what she needs to do, what she doesn't need to do. Um, and then we'll be done with our client. So I would like to thank you so much for watching another episode of the evidence-based esthetician and I look forward to seeing you again. We've got a lot of great topics to cover. Again, please get social with us. Let us know what you would like to see on the evidence-based esthetician. So from Chris Group and Dr. Group, thank you so much for watching. Thank you.